In California, the August complex fire has become the largest fire in state history. The Creek Fire in Central California has burned at least 46,000 acres. 2020 was a terrible year for wildfires in the state of California. Over 4 million acres burned, making the year the worst in the state's recorded history. The Bobcat fire explodes. Some neighborhoods destroyed by flames, others told to pack up and go. But reckoning with the extent of the damage and the fire's long-term impact is complicated and not always exactly as the media portrays it. Here are three things about wildfires that you may not have known. First, fire has been around for a long time and there used to be more of it. I think a lot of people mistakenly believe that we have more fire than is natural in our forests. Fire ecologists, we all agree we have less fire in our western forests than we had historically before fire suppression. No one disputes that. The only thing we really argue about is, you know, how much less do we have? This is fire ecologist Chad Hansen. He's the founder of the John Muir Project, an environmental group that seeks to change fire management practices in California. You take a fire year like 2020. This year is a big fire year relative to the last several decades. But interestingly, historically, before fire suppression, this would be an average year in California, just an average year. A big year would be twice this much or more. Valerie Truet is one of the nation's top dendrochronologists, or tree ring scientists. From tree rings, the oldest trees that we found wildfires in, scars in, in California, the giant sequoias. And from that, we have a record of almost 3,000 years of frequent fires in the Sierra Nevada in California. What was the fire regime like pre-Spanish? Deep, deep history in the state. We know that fires happened very frequently in the past in the Sierra Nevada, and they would burn large areas. And so in that sense, what we're seeing now happening in California is not unprecedented. The big difference is not so much in the size or the frequency of fires in the past versus now. The big difference is the severity of the fires. So fires today are not larger than in the past, but they are more intense. Both experts say that this is due to decades of fire suppression by the nation's forest agencies. In the early 20th century, the U.S. Forest Service was established, and part of its um, mission was to protect forests and to systematically put out these ground fires with the idea that the ground fires were destructive to the forest. By putting them out since the start of the 20th century, we've been creating a buildup of fuel for more than 100 years now. It's not just more fuel, but with uh, anthropogenic climate change, that fuel is also very dry, much drier. So we're in a situation with a lot of very dry fuel that results in the kind of very dangerous fires that we see. Both scientists advocate getting forests, especially remote ones, back to a more natural state. One way to do this is through prescribed burning, intentionally setting fires that consume the undergrowth. And Chad Hansen suggests another strategy is to let certain fires burn. For some people, the idea of letting more fires burn seems really kind of shocking, but we know scientifically we have to let that happen. The forests need fire, they need to burn. They need it for the nutrient cycling to maintain their productivity and richness. Now, to be clear, Hansen is not saying that we should let all fires burn. When there's a big backcountry fire, then we should just accept that that's natural, it's ecologically beneficial, and we can't stop it. We should let more lightning strikes burn in the more remote forests, but when fires are close to a community, then we should focus on that community. But the job number one is to make the communities more fire safe themselves well before fire season, so that when the fires happen, which they will, that community will not burn and lives won't be lost. Another misconception is that fire is relentlessly destructive, killing everything in its path. Chad Hansen says this is usually not the case. One of the most critical things for people to understand is that even in the largest fires, most of the areas burn pretty cool. 
and the trees are just lightly scorched and they survive and thrive no problem. They remain green and there's not much change. The areas that burn hotter, where most or all the trees are killed, that's only 10 to 25% of the forest in the typical, even large fire. To see the impact of a big fire on the forest, we went with Chad to the location of one of the largest fires in recent California history. So we're on the Stanislaw National Forest, just west of Yosemite National Park, where seven years ago, the Rim Fire, one of the five largest fires in the last century in California uh, occurred. People had this impression that the fire, which was 257,000 acres, big fire, they had this impression that all of the trees were killed across the entire fire. And that's not the case at all. In fact, about three quarters of the fire area was low and moderate intensity, where most of the trees survive and are perfectly green and healthy and they're just scorched. Another misconception is that once a fire burns in a forest, if it burns hot enough, the forest will never recover. So we're in one of the largest high intensity fire patches in the Rim Fire in the Sierra Nevada. And uh, right now, we are over a thousand feet away from the nearest live surviving tree. But what we're actually seeing is this incredible natural regeneration of the forest. Ponderosa pines, Douglas fir, sugar pines. Some of the Ponderosa pine regeneration here that I'm looking at is 10, 11, 12 feet tall. Most of it's over six or seven feet tall. And we've got about 300 naturally regenerating uh, conifer saplings per acre in here. Not only do these forests eventually recover, and remember this is just seven years after the Rim Fire, but the remnants of the previous fires, the burned out trunks of dead trees called snags, are actually a resource that aids in the forest's recovery. Some of these snag forest patches, I know almost as well as some people know their living rooms. I mean, I've, I've gone through them so many hundreds of times. And it's so important to leave that alone because the snags, the fire killed trees, they replenish the forest ecosystem. It's some of the best wildlife habitat in the forest and the forest doesn't need any help from us to regenerate. Mother Nature's got that covered. And this idea that if we just spend enough money and have enough equipment and big air tankers and bulldozers, we can somehow stop fire. That is now carried over into the 21st century. And a lot of people still think that. But the science is very clear. We know that's not true. You can't stop fire. You can't eliminate fire from these ecosystems. Fires as natural, including large fires, in these forests as wind and rain. 